2 Corinthians chapter number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. And we come, I want you to read verse number 9 again. 2 Corinthians 1. But we have the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in God which raiseth the dead who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons thanks may be given by many on our behalf. Verse 12. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we've had our, con our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you. For we write none other things unto you than, that, than what you read or acknowledge, and I trust you shall acknowledge even to the end. And also you've acknowledged us in part that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also were ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. And in this confidence I was minded to come unto you before that you might have a second benefit. In other words, I, I wanted to come again so we could have a time of fellowship. And to pass by you, verse 16, into Macedonia and to come again out of Macedonia unto, unto you. So in other words, I'm going I'm to come to you on the front end. And as we go preach and, and talk to the Philippians and others, we're going to come back and get you again. We're going to have a good time. And of you uh, to be brought on my way toward Judea. When I therefore was thus minded, did I use likeness? Or well, the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh? That with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay. But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. And I'll finish in just a moment, but this is, uh, these scriptures can be understood, but I would, I would say they're not the easiest uh, to decipher, but with the help of God tonight, I want to talk to you about these verses and try to dissect what was, what was going on here as we go through the book of 2 Corinthians. Um, when our integrity is attacked, what do you do when your integrity is, is attacked? Many of you have had this happen to you. Now Paul, as I said, he, he had left this church and while he was gone, some men rose up and, and really was questioning his authority, his apostleship, uh, his, his really ability to, to write to them, to preach to them. And uh, these same men was questioning his integrity, the integrity, and we'll, we'll dig into it in a moment, but the fact that he changed his plans and instead of coming back to them, he did not make it back to them. God, through the Holy Spirit, changed his plans. And they were offended, basically, in, in saying that you, you lied to us. You didn't tell us the truth. You said you was going to come back here and you didn't come back here. And so Paul goes on to defend himself and we'll talk about when it's right to defend uh, yourself and, and when it's wrong. And I, and I would say this, it's usually, most of the time, you, you should not defend yourself. Let God defend yourself. Let God defend you. So, oh boy, that's all through Scripture. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. God is the discerner of the intents and thoughts of the heart and he knows people and uh, he will defend you. He is our shield. He is our buckler. He is our defense. And uh, instead of running around trying to defend ourselves, um, very rarely, even when you do, very rarely are you vindicated in the eyes of the offender. Very rarely. But here Paul does defend himself because it is attached to his credibility with the gospel. So when, when somebody is attacking uh, the voice of the gospel, somebody who gives the gospel, when you attack their credibility, you're attacking the message of the gospel. So in that light, usually we're attacked personally. It has nothing to do with the gospel. But in this instance, it was attached to his giving of the gospel 
When you destroy a man's credibility in one area, you've destroyed his credibility to give out the gospel. So Paul uh, defended uh, his decision. He defended why he did what he did, not because he wanted to look better in the eyes of the Corinthians, but because he wanted to defend and he wanted the power of the gospel uh, to go forward. That's why it is so imperative that you and I live lives that are pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ because uh, the weight of the gospel is on our shoulders. The validity of the gospel is on our shoulders. The, the fact that, and we know that Jesus died and was buried and on the third day he arose again. We know that, we praise God for that. That is the gospel and I praise God for the gospel. It is the power of God and the salvation. Uh, but you and I, as the, as the eyes and ears and the feet and hands of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can diminish the power of the gospel by leading a life of no integrity. We can, we can make decisions that limit the power of the gospel. You say, how in the world can that happen? You've seen it happen for years. Satan get in a church or uh, a pastor, and when that church is destroyed, it hurts the credibility of the gospel. And certainly there is no problem with the gospel. There's no fault in the gospel. There's no flaw in the gospel. Amen. So may God in heaven help us to have a sterling reputation and sterling integrity so the power of the gospel can go forth from our life. Amen. And that's why Paul was defending himself. But one of the most painful experiences in your life will be when your integrity is attacked. Painful experience especially when we have gone out of our way to do what's right, when you've gone out of your way to make amends or to do right or to lead a life pleasing to God and then your integrity uh, is attacked. And as pastors and, and folks who uh, stand in front of people and pastor and lead, uh, it's inevitable that your integrity is going to be attacked. And one of the most painful things that I endure as a pastor is when somebody questions my integrity. When I try to do right. And I praise the Lord. I don't think that's happening around here. But it's inevitable for anybody that stands and thunders forth the word of God. Your integrity. I don't care who you are. What kind of man you are. Your integrity will be attacked. You're not above it. Was Jesus above questioning? No. No. No matter who you are, no matter how you try to dot every I and cross every T, and it goes back to the power of the gospel. It goes back to the message. It's not the messenger most of the time. Now, uh, there, there are hirelings in every denomination and every religious realm. There are people uh, who do stuff for the wrong reasons and they, uh, they, they are a shame, a sham, and a disgrace to uh, the word of God and the work of God. And certainly they hurt the cause of Christ in every way. But most of the time it's not something about an individual. It's not a character flaw. It's a message rebellion. If I can discredit a man's character, then I, can, I don't have to listen to the message. But we're bound to the message regardless of the messenger. That's the truth. This Bible stands alone and you will answer God for it. No matter who's done what or who hasn't done what, we will answer to this word. But I can't tell you that it feels good. Has it happened to you? Has your character ever been attacked? Your integrity? Sure. Uh, it has to all of us. It comes with the territory. And, uh, you know, not just pastoral territory. It comes, if you're, if you're in education, your integrity has been attacked. <laughs> and a whole lot of other things. <laughs> if you're in the corporate world, your integrity has been attacked. And so the Apostle Paul endured such attacks from those who seem to be his loyal supporters. Nothing hurts so bad as that. 
And uh, I, I tell you, to, to, to know how many hours that I spend away from my family, and not by choice, by trying to balance both ministry and family, trying to do what I know God's called me to do, and to many times sacrifice time, and I'm trying my best not to do that, but many times it just it happens. Because even the time when you are with your family, you're not with your family. And so to try to balance that and to, and to, to think that as you're spending yourself, and I probably only have, I only have 13, 14 more good years of ministry left. And to think that you'll be hurt by the people that you're trying to help that's a hurtful thing. To know that you put aside people that love you for people that don't. It's hurtful. But if you're going to be in the ministry, that's part of it. You're going to be hurt. You're going to be misunderstood. You're going to be misjudged, misread, and all of that. If you are a Christian tonight, you're going you're to have the same things happen to you. Probably not as many times. Not on as great a scale, but it will happen. And we mentioned before the background of this letter that Paul was having a struggle to defend himself with these antagonistic leaders that he was uh, facing at Corinth. And uh, he had planted the church on his second missionary journey. As I've already mentioned, he spent 18 months there evangelizing, discipling the new converts. Uh, but when he left to go to a, a, a planting mission elsewhere, uh, these new leaders came into position of influence in the church. And uh, I don't know why they attacked him, maybe insecure, maybe jealous. I don't know why they did it. Uh, but the fact is, uh, they, they began to undermine Paul's credibility and to put him down whenever they could. Uh, I would caution you to, to be very careful about putting any preacher down. Not just me, not me. I'd be very careful. Unless I know for sure they're just preaching false doctrine, which Paul readily called out. Unless that's the case, hands off. The Bible says, touch not mine anointed. And I'd be very careful, not just me. And that, that goes from, that's preaching to me about other preachers too. Right. Amen. I don't get a pass because I am a preacher. I don't get, and I've seen preachers that thought they had a pass because they was a pastor. They could talk about other pastors. Not the case. Amen. And may God help us. Paul, I, I, and I don't think he would have reacted. So be careful when I say you know, there's, he, he defended himself. Be careful about, about jumping to defense. I don't think he would have, this was a petty thing, but I don't think Paul would have defended himself except that he knew um, that when a messenger's integrity is suspect, his message becomes suspect. I think that's the only reason here, uh, as I said before, that he, uh, that it became a huge deal. And um, I want you to look at verse number 12 again. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you. Now, he says here, basically, I, I've got a clear conscience before the world and before you. Can you say that you have a clear conscience before the world and before the church? Now, many of us have a clear conscience before the church because they only know the Sunday us. But I wonder, do you have a clear conscience? I mean, the validity of your life and your example for Jesus Christ, do you have a clear conscience of the way that you live your life Monday through Saturday? He said, I have a clear conscience towards the world and towards you. He said, it's clear. And that's a, that's a pretty bold 
uh, statement for Paul to make, but he doesn't hesitate. Uh, his conduct had been without reproach in the church, outside the church. And uh, as I said, some Christians have a fine reputation among the brothers and the sisters, but they're much more careless in the relationship uh, with the business world. And I've had this happen to me. Been, been out talking to somebody and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, out there and somebody is describing to me who I know to be a church member. They're describing to me who I know to be a church member and uh, without knowing I'm their pastor and uh, you know, and, and, and to be honest with you, I couldn't even recognize who they's talking about if I didn't know that that's who they were talking about. You know it ought not be so? I'm thinking, well, who is that? That ain't the fella I know. That ain't the lady I know. It ought not be that way. We ought to have a conscience void of offense toward the world and toward, especially in the church. And instead of, you know, instead of that kind, reasonable person that I knew, uh, they were describing a, a whole other individual. And uh, not good. Not good. And young people, I would ask you, do you have a clear conscience to the people at school, not only in the youth group? I know we can stand tall in the youth group, but what about down the hallways of the school when everybody's cussing? How's, how's our life at school? College? 80% of public college students drink alcohol. How's our testimony at college? A clear conscience? Or is one thing on Sunday, another thing during the week? One thing when we're home in the summer, another thing when we're away at college? You go to the dorm room, you'll find out. You go ask around, you'll find out. Go down to the job, you'll find out. Go to the school, and you'll, you'll find out. The standards Paul is measuring himself by is not worldly standards uh, like success, popularity, good looks, but he, he's measuring himself. Look at it again in verse 12. He says, simplicity and godly sincerity. You know, if you want to you measure yourself by the ethics of the world, you may come out smelling good. If you want to measure yourself by the, you know, well, well they're, they're a good person. They think I'm a good person at work. Well, what, are they, what stick are they using? But it's, it's not sincerity and godly. I mean, it's not godliness. So what measure are they measuring with? But Paul wasn't measuring by worldly standards. He was measuring by the holiness of God. Be holy as I'm holy, 1 Peter 1.15. Uh, but we know we can't measure instinctively up to God's holiness, but we ought to try to be holy as he's holy. We ought to live holy, separated lives. And boy, I'm tired. This line has been dropped. It's been laid in the sand and nobody preaches, nobody practices, nobody believes holiness, but it's still a Bible doctrine. It's still a doctrine in this this Bible that we as believers should follow. It's one of holiness and that doesn't just mean at church. That means Monday through Saturday when you're at work, uh, when you're not at work, when you're doing uh, me time stuff, family time stuff, there's a standard of holiness that God sets. What is the standard, Pastor? The standard is God's holiness. Well, I'll never meet up to that. We might as well not even try. No, he commanded us to be holy as I'm holy. God's people should be peculiar. They should be different. Different. They should be set apart. They should act different. They should look different. They ought to be different than this world by and large. And I know we have to go and buy and sell and work and be among the world, uh, but we certainly should not be of them. Amen. There ought to be a difference. They ought to know you at work. You ought to be already marked. You ought to have a mark on you at work, at school. You ought to have a mark. And you don't even have to try hard to do that. Just live for God a little bit and they'll mark you. But he said, I, my, my standard is, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he said, not only simplicity, but godly sincerity. What does that sincerity mean right here? It means without hypocrisy. It means not a fake. And not a fake. And this word comes from two Latin words. 
C-I-N-E, sine, sere, C-E-R-E, two words. And it means without wax, without wax. And in Bible days, they would make, they would make pots and pottery. And uh, if they, they made a pot and um, that thing had a crack in it, man, they're not going to destroy the whole pot. Uh, they got to get some money out of this pot. They done spent all their time, their effort, the clay, uh, the fire. They've spent all this. They've invested in this pot. They got to get something out of the pot. So they take a little wax, slap the wax on there, uh, paint that buddy again, and uh, they'd, they'd sell the pot. After they put wax on the crack, they put wax in that crack. So then when they, when they were, when whoever bought the pot would go to uh, boil some water, make some soup, they had wax soup. <laughs> he said, this word sincerity means without wax. It means not a fake. Boy, this world deserves to see somebody that genuinely loves Jesus Christ, somebody that genuinely cares about their testimony, their integrity, cares about the word of God, cares about their life in relation to the word of God. We need, a, we have a generation that has yet to see people who are following uh, the Bible closely and standing up for biblical principles. We need people and the people of Freedom Baptist Church should be those kind of people uh, that stands up for biblical principles. The boss is not going to pass one over on you. He's not going to talk you into being uh, to cheating somebody or to doing something under the table and the students are going to act in integrity and not cheat and not copy off the internet and not copy this and copy that and use your watch when you're sitting in class to answer questions. Amen. Amen. And uh, we need people of integrity and examples of integrity. Well, we live in such a day, we'll just pass on lies and, uh, and Christian people will accept them. But Paul said, look, I'm gonna stand for the, the, my integrity and I want you to know the gospel is relying on the fact that I'm credible. And God's people ought to be credible without wax, without just that fakeness, fraud. You ought to be real. Not perfect, you're not perfect. You're gonna mess up. Boy, we ought, to, and ought not be fake. Amen. And the world knows if you're fake or not. I can tell if I'm talking to somebody about an employee and they go to church here, I can tell right off if they're fake or not. By the way, they talk to me. They know you. They know. First thing out of their mouth, if you're real, they're going to say it. I tell you right now, you got one right there, Pastor. You got a good one right there. That ought to be a testimony of God's people here. It's without, without wax. That's how our lives should be. What you see is what you get. That's what Paul claimed here. He had a correlating conscience. You can read all the ethics books in the world you want, but it won't make you that ethical person. Only the Holy Spirit of God working in you, it takes divine power to bring forth a life of integrity. There ought to be, there ought to be a correlating conscience in verse 12. In other words... What we say is what we ought to be. What we say we are is what we ought to be. That it ought to bear witness. Our testimony in the world ought to bear witness to our testimony at church. And boy, going to a public school, I've seen people who are members of the best churches in this area. Cuss like sailors, do all kinds of stuff, and be at the youth revivals and raise their hand and shout. It's not the way it ought to be. Now, all of us are going to have, we're going to have, we, don't raise your hand. How many of you have absolutely never, ever backslid? And if you raise your hand, you're lying. <laughs> Just before you do it. We all going to have seasons in our life. I'm not talking about that. It ought to match. It ought to match. Our life in the world and our life at church, it ought to match. He had a correlating conscience. His life matched what he said, matched what he, what he did. In verse 13, For we write in other things unto you that what ye read or acknowledge, and I trust you to acknowledge even to the end, as also ye have acknowledged us in part, and that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. And basically he says here, I, I spoke to you in, in terms that you could understand and apply. You acknowledged it, you accepted it, you received it. I didn't speak to you uh, in, in the ancient languages. He said, I spoke to you. I mean, he put the cookies on the bottom shelf. He said, I spoke to you like you could handle it. And, and they did. And I appreciate preachers who uh, put it where people can understand it. And, and there's, there's no harm. I, I think you ought to study Greek and Hebrew. I think, I, you know, as a pastor, I ought to study through that stuff and, and I've taken it and uh, I ought to study it, but I'm not going to get up here and use that a lot. Amen. Because I don't want you thinking you got to know Hebrew and Greek to study your Bible. Amen. And so you, I, I think preachers, and a lot of times it, it, it comes off prideful now, I think if, if I can give you a Greek word that helps you understand the meaning of, of a verse, we ought to give it. Amen. But four or five every, every sermon, probably not healthy. Not healthy. We ought to give, we ought to give things where people can, can understand it. And not try to, he said, I didn't try to impress you. Uh, you, you understood and, and heard what I had to say. And uh, then we come to these roadblocks. Look at verse 14. He said, even as ye also are ours in the day of Jesus. One of these days, we, we're gonna be, you're my rejoicing now. One, one day, we're gonna be each other's rejoicing when we see Jesus because I want you to understand what I've got to say. I want you to understand that I genuinely love you. I genuinely care about you. I want you to get uh, what I'm saying because one day we're gonna be uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. And he says, I want you to be my rejoicing and I want to be your rejoicing. I want us to fellowship, have sweet fellowship together. And you know, it ought to be that way in God's house. We, we ought to be able to fellowship with people and you're not right with God if there's somebody here that you can't fellowship with. Amen. Let me say that one more time. You're not right with God if there's somebody here that you can't fellowship Amen. with. It ought, to, it ought to be that way. Now, there are some people that have, uh, you know, interest, and sometimes it don't matter about all the interest. Me and Brother Clint have very little in common except Jesus Christ. <laughs> but I love him with all my heart, and I hope he loves me. And uh, California, North Carolina, country, non-country, <laughs> it's not such a word as that, right? Man, I love him. He's funny. I'm serious. But I love him. We sit together and just talk and I'll walk and pace. He'll sit and talk and I'll walk and pace. That's just what we do. And when I walk and pace, he understands it's not disrespect or I'm trying to hurry him up. That's just what I do. I walk and pace. I'm coming back. Just keep talking. <laughs> And, uh, but it's, it's wonderful. What, what is that? I could care less about how many of, uh, you know, how many things we got in common as far as uh, human, humanly speaking. But when you got Jesus Christ as the basis of your relationship, you got the foundation. Amen. You got the most important thing. And uh, so, it, you know, the other stuff is just human talk. We got what matters. And, uh, and that's what you ought to have. And, and God's people, you ought to be, no matter who's different, some of you like fishing, some of you don't. Some of you like, some of you ladies don't like shopping. I don't know who that is. <laughs> There's probably one or two of you. And, uh, and, and but it, 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 you know, it doesn't matter beyond that. It's okay. Boy, her personality, my personality, just really don't, don't jive. Well, if you're really in love with Jesus, it probably don't matter if your personality jives or not. Because the Holy Spirit of God can unjive personalities. I'm tired of hearing that. Our personalities just don't click. Well, I'm glad the Holy Spirit can unclick those little clicks. He can fix that. If you let God help you, you can get along with a whole lot more people than you ever thought you could. But what we do, we just get in our little corner and we refuse to allow God to help us Love people and like people that, that we don't want to. So instead of working at it, which, well, they're on the other side of the church. I don't know if I can make it all the way over there. 
If I was giving away pecan pies on the other side of that church, I promise you, you could. Amen, Miss Glenda. She's not here tonight, but she gives me a bag of pecan pies every once in a while. It's a blessing. But these, these teachers had, had set up roadblocks to really a, a fellowship relationship that should be there. And I want us to see the causes of the conflict. We've got to move on. But, you know, attacks most of the time, here's where problems start. I want to tell you. It's when we misread motives. It's when we misread motives. The cause of the conflict. It's a misreading of motives. Don't ever be very careful when you discern motives of another person. You may know the facts. The facts are the fruit. I got you. Hallelujah. Amen. But don't ever, ever, ever try to discern somebody's motives. That comes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear for the judgment seat. That's where that happens. 1 Corinthians 3, that wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, and precious stone, that's God's work. You may know what somebody did, but don't ever try to think you know why they did it. You may know the fact. They did it, it's a fact, Pastor. Okay, gotcha. But boy, where we mess up and we cause a lot of problems, it's when we, well, I know why they sit over there. No, you don't. I know why they went over there. They got all the money. That's where they went. I know they being friends with them because they got all the money. You don't know that. We discern motives. And it gets us in trouble. If I could ask anything of you as a church, I would say be very careful about trying to discern the pastor's motives. Because there's a lot of inf information that I may have that I can't disseminate. So I may make decisions that you boy on this front side. I don't know why they're doing that. I don't know why you don't ever let them do that. There's probably a reason. I can't get up and just say, this is why we're not doing that. This is why we're not doing that. This is why I'm doing this. Sometimes it's just not information. And be very careful about discerning somebody's motives because usually you're wrong. But he... he in verses 15, and in this confidence, I was minded to come unto you before that you might have a second benefit. In other words, I intended uh, to come to you. I planned to visit you on my last trip to uh, Macedonia. And uh, I, I was coming back and uh, visit the church, verse 16, to pass by you into Macedonia and to come again out of Macedonia to you and of you to be brought on my way toward Judea, when I therefore was thus minded, did I use likeness? He said, was I, when I intended to do that, was I flippant? Was I just throwing out some words or did I really mean what I said? He said, I meant what I said. I wasn't just, just talking. Or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? He said, did I change my mind that easy? No. Verse 18, but as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. He said, I want to tell you right now, and I'm going to paraphrase this for sake of time. He said, all of our messages in Jesus Christ was yea and yea and amen. He said, there was no flim-flamming back and forth. He said, it was Jesus Christ. He's the only way to heaven. It was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There was no deliberating in my message. It wasn't yea and nay. It wasn't maybe, maybe not. It was Jesus is the way uh, for the Jew and for the Greek. He said, there was, no, uh, there was no debating or dialogue about the message. It was yes and yes and amen. And he said, I want to tell you, I had every intentions of coming back through here. And visit you. Because I don't just flippantly change my mind. And, uh, and you know, over the years, this happens. I've never intentionally lied to anybody. But I want to tell you right now, that's why you got to be careful about discerning motives. When you got 500 things that you already said yes to and you got 50 slots, something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. Be very careful when you... When you I, I did this to a preacher one time when I was 19 years old, 20 years old. And I regret every day of it. He said he's going to do something for me and he didn't do it. I thought, 
I don't even know how you can get up in the pulpit next Sunday. You told me he was going to get, the, he was going to get me some material together for, uh, for a crusade or something I was doing. I thought, my goodness, I don't know how in the world you can get up there and preach. And you told me you was going to get that material together. You didn't do it. And he on purpose did that too. Because he hated my guts, so he wasn't going to get that material together. You know, that's where we go a lot of times. We, we turn that person into a vigilante. And man, we, 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 we say all kinds of things that they never intended. Do you know what, what the root of that was? Was he a liar? No, he wasn't a liar. You know what the root of that was? He had too much going on. And who am I to say that my stuff was more important than what else he had going on? Boy, God set me straight on that. You just hold on. You go get your own material. That's what the Lord told me. You're 20 years old. You can go get your own material. Amen. You leave that pastor alone. He's busy. You're going to know that one day. And the boy, as a 47-year-old pastor, <sighs> I know. I know all about it. So one time I hear a preacher, you said we was going to, we was going to turn this into this and do this and do that. Do you know what? At that time, I intended every bit of that. Do you know how many things come along in between those times? And it's not a matter of trying to deceive people. I wouldn't hurt. You think I'd give my life to try to hurt you? I've sacrificed myself and my family to try to help you. I'm certainly not going to do anything to try to on purpose hurt you. And boy, be careful. We, all, we owe it to each other to give them the benefit of the doubt. Don't be, don't be dancing around trying to interpret motives. Because a lot of times we're not right. We're not, we don't know, we don't know why, why it happened. And, uh, you know, here, here's most of our problem. This is the number one cause of the demise of the family and the church. It's called a suicide. It's a new word. Don't look it up because it's not there. <laughs> a suicide. Let me give you the definition. And this is not original with me. A suicide leads to the death of relationships through the assumption of less than honorable motives. When we assume people had less than honorable motives, we destroy the basis for relationship. And when we're so prone to suspicion, uh, we become offended or hurt. We immediately begin to look for evidence that that person did us wrong. And how many times have you done that in parenting? You've done that in the marriage. And, uh, but, you know, I, you, you can't tell me how many times you've done it, but I promise you can tell me how many times it was done to you. Because that's how we keep score. <laughs> but God help us to let that stuff go. Let it go. And... Uh, because, you know, most people in here are not going to purposely hurt you. Really. If you really think about it, most people in this building are not going to on purpose hurt you. I was talking to somebody the other day. Pastor, they're, they, they're following me. For who's following me? I said, I said, sir, I know they're not following me. They're not following me. I got more things to do than follow you. <laughs> they're not following me. It's like that lady coming to the pastor. I've heard me tell us that lady coming to the pastor. The pastors took me and followed me everywhere I go. I looked out the window the other night. They're there. I got on the city bus today. They're there. They follow me. I look back. They're following me. And uh, old pastor, I mean, every week they're back. He said I couldn't do nothing. Everything I tell her didn't work. Nothing worked. I couldn't get them all. I couldn't quit. And she just, hey, pastor, they're following me. And uh, we've had some experiences like that. And they're following me, Pastor. What am I going to And finally, he said, God, give me the answer. He said, come on in and meet with me. He brought her in there with the secretary. Had two, two people in. He said, he said, I know who they are now. He said, I know who they are. I took her to Psalm 23. He said, see this right here? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the, all the days of my life. He said, I'll tell you who they were. There was goodness and mercy. He said, she never came back. <laughs> In marriage, you know, most men are not as evil as you think they are, ladies. And I don't, you know, duck right 
Uh, you know, most of the rotten things that are done by man in the marriage, ladies, are, are because of uh, insensitivity and self-absorption. It's usually not because they're an evil person. The major defect in, in most men sometimes it's not selfishness or, or abusiveness. Sometimes it's just cluelessness. <laughs> they got to know what's going on. But boy, we'll have them. I mean, they knew exactly what they did. They calculated. I know they knew. They knew I was going to walk across that floor at the time and then they left that shoe right there for me. You know, they done planned your death by leaving a shoe on the floor. No, they left their shoe on the floor because they was dropped over tired going to bed and they just forgot to pick it up. Had nothing to do with them trying to kill you. <laughs> Wasn't it funny how we turn everything that's done to us like that? It's all secret. I mean, it's all conspiracy. When it's, when it's to us, it's all conspiracy. If it was from you to somebody else, oh, I damn what? And it's just an oversight. It's an oversight with you, but when it's to you, it's a conspiracy. You know, everybody's after me. Everybody's, everybody's going to get me. Here's some things to ask, and I'm coming in for a landing. Here's some things to ask. Why don't we ask, I wonder what's going on in that person's life that would have caused them to behave that way. I mean, really. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Say, I wonder what's going on in their life that caused me to, want to, to act that way. Or, or I wonder what I don't know that might explain this decision. You don't, you don't know a good one? I wonder what I don't know that might explain this decision that I don't understand. That may help you. Instead of jumping to conclusions, it may help you to do that. Or, I wonder how I come across, how did I come across? Did this generate some sort of reaction because of the way I come across? Did I come across in some way that, that added to this reaction? You know, the fact is we're all sinners who would rather blame somebody than understand them. We're all sinners that would rather blame somebody than understand them. We'd rather blame people because it, it takes time to try to understand. It takes questions. Under, we just rather uh, you know, indict them, hang them, and then figure it out. I mean, you're guilty until proven innocent. It's the way we operate. But at the same time, we seek self-justification, rationalization for our own feelings. May God help us. May God help us. Um, then look at verse 18. But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea. And now he gives a calculated charge here. He gives a defense and, and he appeals to several things. Faithfulness. Uh, I mean, he, he said there was no waffling when we were giving you message when Silas and Timothy and, and we, we were preaching. He said we, we were strong. We weren't giving, uh, we weren't waffling. Then verse 22, who hath it? And then he goes through and basically gives credibility about, he said, verse 22, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the spirit in our hearts. And he just talks about, about faithfulness and about his validity here and uh, the fact that this message is true. And uh, I mean, be careful because because misunderstandings can rip apart the fabric of a church. Misunderstandings and, and trying to figure out motives can rip apart a church. And he said, I, I'm going to give you the reasons why my message is violated. And he goes through here and uh, he, he gives us these reasons. He's anointed us. He's put a seal of his ownership on me, he says. In verse 23, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. Then he goes on to stay and for sake of time, he goes on to say, the reason I didn't come to you was for your good because I knew I'd already laid it on you the first letter. I'd already give it to you hot and heavy the first time. And he said, so I didn't want to be the bearer of bad news again. And he said, I was trying to allow God to do a work uh, in your heart so that I didn't come right back with another pounding message on you. The reason I didn't come to you uh, was for you. Then he goes on to tell him at the end how much he loves him. That was the real motive of why he didn't go to him that second time. 
He said, really, it was because I loved you so much that I knew it wasn't the right time to skin your hide again. If you really want to know the truth, I knew that it wasn't right and I, I wasn't ready for it and I wouldn't be in a good mood and I don't need that right now because God's brought me through all these things we mentioned in chapter one. It just wasn't the right time to come back and, uh, and do some skinning again. And he said, because of my love for you is why I did it. And you know, there's so many times in our marital relationships, parental relationships, kids, uh, quit trying to figure out why your parents did such and such. There's things you may not ever know. I'll never forget this, this, this uh, youth pastor and, and, the, and the kids and the parents and all was wanting everybody to go to this person's house that had just joined the church. It's almost raising up a, a voice against the pastor because he said no. What the pastor couldn't tell, he was, he was thinking that the guy may have been a homosexual. But he didn't, have, he didn't have all the information to prove it, but he certainly didn't want all the teenage boys going over to this homosexual's house to go swimming. Amen. 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 But how are you going to express that? <coughs> how are you going to explain that? Sometimes it's just a matter of trust. If you know a person loves you, and I want to say to you as your pastor, I do love you. I hope you know that. If you don't, I don't have anything else to give. <laughs> I don't have anything else to prove to you that I love you. I love you. I'm not, I'm not going to keep things. And we're not, we're not going to do things to hurt you, and we're not going to make decisions to hurt you, but sometimes that you just got to trust the fact that the pastor loves me, and if he thought this was a good thing, he'd be doing it. Because a lot of times I may say nothing, not because I'm for it, but because I, I, I need to get my facts together before I say something. So saying nothing most of the time for me is probably not a good idea until I figure out how to say no. <laughs> so you know what? We need to trust each other. Trust each other. Hey, people on the left side, you know what you need to do? Trust people on the right side. <laughs> People in the middle, you got a big problem. You got to trust people on both sides. <laughs> we need to trust each other. Get the benefit of that. Quit trying to discern motives. I bet I know why he parked that old car up front so everybody see it. You ever figured he may be handicapped? But he laid his sticker on the dash instead of putting it from the rearview mirror and you didn't see it? Boy, we jumped, don't we? How many of you know we jump to conclusions? We do. See somebody, see somebody with a hoodie on? We know they was black. We didn't see a face inside the hoodie. What color was it? Black? You know I'm telling it right right now. Right? Now, I'm not saying it was or wasn't. I'm just saying we jump real quick to conclusions. But of all people that need to benefit of the doubt, you know who does? We do. You need to give each other the benefit of the doubt. Paul was at his integrity was, and be careful about attacking somebody's integrity or calling in the question. Well, I don't know why Pastor did that. I don't know why he did it. I, I really don't agree with him. I don't know. Well, what you just did there was attack the integrity of that decision. Well, I didn't say nothing. Right, exactly. Oh, man, I, I, that'd be great. I'm sure that'd be good. Be careful how we respond. Not just me. I, this wasn't a pastor message tonight. This is for God's people to get along and not to jump to conclusions. Be very careful about how we interpret somebody's motives as to why they did what they did or why they didn't do what they didn't do. Be very careful. Because at the end, Paul said, I have all these things. I have faithfulness have the seal of God, the call of God. I mean, I've been ordained of God, he said. Paul said, I, I, he said, I, I'm, I'm, I need to be giving you this message. I got your credentials. And we need to be careful about how we jump to conclusions on people. May God help us with that. Hey, husbands, wives, husbands and wives, I'm done.
husbands and wives, be careful about jumping to conclusions with your spouses. Be careful with that. Why they did what they did. I know why you keep going down there to that store. That cashier down there, you keep going to that same store. Well, you know, not to defend your husband. That may be the case. <laughs> but you know what? Listen, and if he is, guess what he is? Wrong and sorry. Wrong and sorry. But it may be that's the only place around that has craft mayonnaise. <laughs> Amen? Or Peter Pan peanut butter. You don't, we don't know. A lot of times we don't know stuff. We jump real quick. How many of y'all have ever got mad ahead of time on something that you found out later wasn't what you thought it was? I mean, storming mad. Yeah. Guilty as charged. Let's work on it. And then let's work on our conversation in the world and at church. You, you teenagers ought to have the same testimony at college as you do here. You ought to have the same testimony at school as you do here. Businessmen, you ought, not, you ought to have the same testimony at work as you do here. You ought not have a, a womanizing, underhanded, cheating, embezzling testimony at work and a sterling testimony here. It ought to be, it ought to be the same. It ought to be the same. May God help us.